Well, it's Friday. Well, it will be when you see this. Friday, July 31st, 2020. My name is Frico, and this is Frico Talks News. Got some stuff to talk about here that, uh, well, we're going to start off right away, because that's what we do here. That's what I do here. I am the we in this story, and that's the way it always has to be. That's just the way it has to be. We're going to start off with the, <coughs> this is Three Gorgeous Dam. Everybody knows, everybody following Three Gorgeous Dam. You know, my prayer is personally out to Chinese people. I don't support the CCP, but I do not want that dam to break. Please, for the love of whatever, please don't let that dam break. That's what everybody's looking at. A lot of problems, a lot, a lot of, a lot of tough times over in China right now, and and I and I feel so bad because, uh, you know, some people, I understand, I I know I'm I'm pretty ticked at the CCP for a lot of reasons, but there's a lot of people out there in China that are just they're fundamentally they are, they're not part of it and they're being wiped out. So I'm really concerned about what's going on over there. But this story isn't about what's going on right now, although it is relevant to what has been happening. And uh, this is an article in Scientific American that is from all the way back in March 25th, 2028, and it was written by Amara Vasandahi. Vasandahi. I don't know anything about her. And here's an excerpt from it, and I'm going to read from it. And just, 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 just take it in. Just take it in. Among the damage wrought, there has been a lot less rain, a lot more drought, and the potential for increased disease, says George Davis, a tropical medicine specialist at the George Washington University Medical Center, Washington, D.C., who has worked in the Yangtze River Basin and neighboring provinces for 24 years. When it comes to environmental change, the implementation of the Three Gorges Dam and Reservoir is, is the great granddaddy of all changes. <coughs> Chinese and foreign scientists... Oh, there, now, that, now, this is another... This isn't a continuation of what you saw. This is another excerpt from the article. So, so I'm just taking these little excerpts here just to give you the, the important points here. So here's the next excerpt. Chinese and foreign scientists, meanwhile, warned that the dam could endanger the area's remaining residents. Among their concerns, landslides caused by increased pressure on the surrounding land, a rise in waterborne disease, and a decline in biodiversity. But their words fell on deaf ears. Harnessing the power of the Yangtze has been a goal since nationalist leader Sun Yat-sen first proposed the idea in 1919. Mao Zedong, the father of China's communist revolution, rhapsodized the dam in a poem. The mega project could not be realized in his lifetime, however, because the country's resources were exhausted by the economic failures of the Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s, and then the social upheaval of the Cultural Revolution from the mid-1960s uh, through to the early 1970s. Four decades later, the government resuscitated Mao's plan, the first of the Yangtze-famed gorges, a collection of steep bluffs at a bend in the river, was determined to be the perfect site. The effects of the dam... Now, now, that's... I'm going to stop there. I keep trying to read past, and I want to make sure now. Now we're going to get to the next uh, excerpt. So so you're getting here in this first part, you're getting this the nationalist element to this project. Why this project was important for more reasons than just uh, the utility of, of, of what it could potentially offer the land. It, it is certainly a heroic endeavor and quite... A statement by a nation state to be able to build the structures that uh, China built there massive massive state of uh, uh, I'm sure a massive source of national pride so the effects of the dam's disturbance of the whole ecosystems could reverberate for decades GW's Davis is part of a project researching the disease uh, skit Holes 
Skatosomiasis. Skatosomiasis. A.K.A. snail fever or swimmer's itch. A blood parasite transmitted to humans by snails. People can get it by swimming or raiding and wading in contaminated fresh water when infected snails release larvae that can pretend penetrate the skin. Symptoms include fever, appetite and weight loss, abdominal pain, bloody urine, muscle and joint pains, along with nausea, a persistent cough, and diarrhea. The snails used to breed on small floodplain islands where annual flooding prevented a population explosion. Now, the decreased flow downstream from the dam is allowing the snails to breed unchecked, which has already led to a spike in schistosomiasis cases in some areas. We'll get to our next excerpt. You, you took that in, right? You took that in. Now, remember, remember, this is written in 2008, everybody. 2008. According to Davis, such alterations could precipitate a rise in other microbial waterborne diseases as well. Once you dramatically change the climate and change water patterns, as is now seen in the Three Gorges region, he says, you change a lot of environmental variables. Almost all infectious diseases are up for grabs. Ah. I'm going to read that again, ready? Remember who Davis is? I gave you his credentials. So, you know, worked in the Yangtze River Basin and neighboring provinces for 24 years. And he's, this is what he does for a living. So take that for what it's worth. But there is that 2000, 2008. Remember, 2008. According to Davis, such alterations could precipitate a rise in other microbial waterborne diseases as well. Once you dramatically change the climate and change water patterns, as is now seen in the Three Gorges region, he says, you change a lot of environmental variables. Ready? Ready? I want you to get this last one here. Almost all infectious diseases are up for Grabs. And in this cocktail of stews of stuffs and whatnots, I mean, that's just snails. That's just snails. The unexpected sudden explosion. Now, remember, not only are, are these uh, populations now, well, being occupied by snails, they're, they're being occupied by humans, too. So there's that, and there's stuff. And they have created this heavenly zone. And, and honestly, if you could build and pull this off in a way, but uh, you see, you got some problems. You got some problems. You got some problems in the mix. It has to do with the type of systems that you have. And what type of... Uh, I'm going to use this word loosely, but I'm going to use the word authenticity authenticity and I'm going to use it in the strictest sense of the term that you have the capacity to say what you at least perceptively believe you mean you're not you're not obfuscating you're not lying you're not uh, exaggerating a similarity that is really not all that important to you to, to gain favor uh, you're you are or expressing all, y as simply as you can uh, with the other person as if they are to some degree a co-equal and you are speaking with authenticity. So you need these types of systems when you're doing anything that has to do with engineering. You need to be able to speak very, very, very candidly and very frankly. And see, that's the problem. The official recognition of the dam's dangers suggests that the project's environmental and public health impacts are starting to sink in. Political analysts, analysts speculate that President Hu Jintao and Premier Wen Jiabo are eager to distance themselves from a project they inherited. Although, halting plans at this point would be a mission of government error. The openness following 
The Chang Qing meeting raised the hopes of worried scientists that the officials would take action to minimize the project's environmental and public health fallout. You have this massive project that affects hundreds of millions of human lives before it's ever built. And I want to dispel people of, of a myth. And the myth is that China is a police state. It is for some areas, for some places. But it's not that it wouldn't want to be a police state in totality. But in point of fact, China, the authority, when the mass of Chinese people decide that they've had enough, there is risk of blood being shed, and it could very well be yours. So... They do not have complete control over the Chinese people. I want you to consider that when you take into account that you have a project that is involves millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of human lives. And uh, you got to get it done. And you realize, I'm sure they did, you only have a small window. Because the longer this thing takes to get done, the the more opposition is going to build. <laughs> it's going to be more and more difficult for you to manage to pull this off without having to exact some measure of significant uh, coercive action, which at the end of the day, they don't have. No one has. You don't, you, you can't really, if 1.5, 1.3, whatever, 1.3, 1.5 billion people on mass decide they've had enough you ain't stopping that there's no way there's this the chinese government can't even afford to to allow too many human beings amongst them to have the the special license to lethal action they they got to keep them numbers small for a lot of reasons i won't get into that but so the circumstances you have a system that is built fundamentally around an adherence to a strict uh ideology that can be uh, co-opted in all kinds of ways pretty quickly to bring any type of uh, life-destroying accusations to a human being and the fundamental authority rests in the level of authority that the person has who's made the accusation. It's the authority of the person itself that decides the guilt or innocence. That's the system fundamentally that we're talking about and that's well, there's a lot of systems like that, but this this is a system that is on the far, far towards, I mean, a very, very extreme version of that. So you have this system here that, I, I mean, I don't want to talk forever and too long about this because I want to try to, I don't I want to, I only want the show to be about an hour long, but. I just want to point this out. First off, the, 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 the really, really, salient point as far as what's going on here and now my i'm not sure if it's the the all of the evidence that seems to be coming out that shows the 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 lack of consideration that was made as far as how the thing was built how much of it became party politicking and opportunities for party I mean, you have a system that rewards authority fundamentally, so it's not the engineers that are ultimately going to be the ones that are going to be able to speak candidly. No one speaks candidly at all in that system. Everybody speaks with fear and manipulation, and and that's all that they can afford to do unless they're the guy at the top. And even the guy at the top has to speak with fear and manipulation because everybody's knifed for him, and he knows it. That's the system. That's fundamentally the system. And every once in a while you get somebody who's incredibly charismatic who wins over a significant portion of centers of power and there's some relative peace in the land. But at that time, that wasn't the case. There's a, I mean, you just you got two guys that were calling themselves leaders. It wasn't really until 2017 when they finally got to the Mao Zedong kind of uh, level of control in the hands of one person, and that's Chairman Xi, when he changed everything with his Z thoughts and but, you know, go check out Z Thoughts. You know, I'll freak your freaking mind out. Yeah, I'm not going to go into it because, anyway. Uh, and then the other part, the, 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 the other point being uh, the, 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 the incubator of 
of infectious diseases that this project has has potentially wrought upon the land and how this you know i like calling it the ccp virus i didn't invent that i've heard a few people call it that i i, I like that because what i really like about it is not chinese it's not about chinese people i love the chinese people it is about the chinese communist party i hate that that fucking thing with a passion but the chinese people man you got you got my i don't know i wish i could do something for you i wish uh uh yeah i wish the world was helping you right now and it's a shame that we're not and i don't care if the chinese communist party is in power we should still be helping you but that, anyway that's not never mind i don't want to you know i understand if people disagree with me i totally get that why you would because yeah so I'm going to go to the next topic here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time to move on. It's time to get the moving on with the moving on. We're going with scrolls with cat moms. I just want to take that in, uh, scrolls with cat moms, as we're talking about kids. Are you all with me on the scrolls with cat moms? You're probably thinking to yourself right now, what the fuck is he talking about, scrolls with cat moms? Let me tell you. I've been watching these, the Dodos. You guys watch the Dodo videos on the YouTubes? I love the Dodo videos, and I never, I won't say never, I hardly ever click on them. I watch them without the sound, and the, I just watch it in the, you know, it shows up in your feed thingy, and if the picture moves, you can watch the whole video without having to listen, and you're just reading the subtitle. I prefer it that way. Their music, it just makes me too freaking happy, and I can't afford to be that happy. I'll have a false sense of uh, optimism that will be quickly crushed and leave me dead on the side of the road. So I can't afford that. So I just watch it with the captions. And when I watch it, what I find is, well, squirrels with cat moms. Dogs that grow up with cats. Cats that grow up with dogs. Squirrels that grow up with cows. Cows that grow up with dogs. Uh, badgers that uh, grow up and kill everyone in the house. Oh, that one. That was a good one. You didn't see that one. I think they deleted it right afterwards. They're like, oh, this is kind of, uh, kind of not what. I'm just kidding. It never happened. I made that video. That was my family. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have a family yet. Well, I did before the bat. Never, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so scrolls with cat moms. So I saw this. I'll just focus on this one. That squirrely early grew up uh, cat mom. So cat has these kittens, and, and then they brought home this little squirrel that fell out of its squirrel whatever. Do squirrels have nests? Whatever squirrels have fell out of the squirrel whatever. All alone in the world. Cat took the squirrel in. And uh, or just the cat had a letter, handed the squirrel to the cat. The cat just starts just licking that squirrel up and down. It's like, yo, I guess this is uh, like this one probably has cancer. Probably going to die. I better be really nice to this one because this one's freaking ugly. You know, <laughs> that's probably what was going on. That's probably what's always going on with these animals that get on her. It's like, oh, my gosh, cancer on the face. That's what that is. That's cancer of the face. This one's not gonna live long. I got, you know what? I can feel. I, you know, I feel for you. I feel you're probably in a lot of pain. I'm gonna make it comfortable for you because you're gonna die soon. And then when the animal grows up and bees like this big badass, you're like, yo, man, that's mine. <laughs> that came from me. That little cat, you know, that 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 had the little pit bull puppy. Pit bull grows up, still emotionally attached to the cat, and just totally at the cat's mercy. Uh, still badass with everyone else, but but mom is mom, and uh, his mom's a cat. And that's the way it is. And you know, mom is like, <laughs> oh, dude, dude, check that out, check that out right over there. You see that? Yo, you got a problem with me? That's my son. That's literally my son. Literally, I I nurtured him from birth. I did that. That's my boy. Can you imagine how that cat feels? Imagine how that dog feels. That squirrel. Squirrel, man. Squirrel. 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 Acting like cat. Acting like a cat. Acting like a cat. Took on the 
I guess you could say, took on the vehicles of power of Katniss. See, cat, I think of all of our constructs, even cats, animals have their constructs, what you call, what, what many people call constructs, I call vehicles of power. And my vehicles of power, I think, a little bit more sophisticated and multi-layered than your, I think, your overly simplistic construct concept in and of itself. But anyway, these... Uh, these these vehicles of power that the the cat have that these these customs methods patterns that well in this case cat develops for cat potential cat has potential and well, cats have ranges of potential within the parameters of what they are because there's different physical abilities deficiencies whatnots. But on the main, on the aggregate, there is uh, a large similar catness, and uh, that type of catness is the type of catness that cats transfer to other cats. It's it's not just genetic or biological. It's clearly a measure of uh, catness that the cat inherits, an aggregate emergent expression of the potential for catness that becomes the habit of catness. And uh, the squirrel, who does not possess, has some similarity, not jarring enough, and that's, that's in the advantage, but does not possess some of the key elements of Katniss, yet nonetheless will, would adopt the Katniss, become more like a, act more like a cat, identify with a cat. I just thought uh, most of us are, are squirrels with cat families. And that's the way it's designed. We're squirrels with cat families. Most of us. What I mean by it is, we are, uh, just like the squirrel, the squirrel is just thrown into an environment in which, in this case, it has very, it has very little capacity to seek to understand what is outside of what is immediately in front of it. I'm imagining a squirrel does not, necessarily have the analytical pondering capacity to make connections and forms and seek to construct what it understands based upon its own understanding so to speak but they're just given into what is and they become what is around them this is largely the fate of almost all of biological existence I imagine but the human seems to have theoretically some capacity to break this form and to actually maybe reinvent what the world might be even if it's only in their own head to make their own vehicles of power and to do it with some degree of 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 deliberateness to s understand to 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 have the capacity to look at the cat and see that the cat before you is not necessarily what what the forms told you it was mom mom that cat maybe if you had the ability the time the habit to even think to take the time to process what's in front of you with your own freaking eyes and what you see in the reflection or what you see in the cat and you're like, hey, something doesn't line up. I don't know necessarily that that cat looks like me. Now, the cat in the story, by the way, is all of the vehicles of power that most of us have to choose that have been largely constructed by, well... In, in this case, I'm going to call them malevolent cats. In this case, we have benevolent cats. These cats are just being cats. But these, these other guys, they're actually squirrels too that are acting like cats to get you to act like squirrels so that they can pretend that they're cats, metaphorically speaking. Um, so you are what the other says that you are for the most part in a world in which you do not have the time space resources or even are born into a system that develops your habit of 
of inquiry, self-inquiry especially. And when that doesn't happen, in which case, we're, that's where we're at now, we're, we, most, most of human history has been this way, largely. But uh, I say right now, it's almost at this point an engineered intentionality to hyper hyper focus on uh on 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 the human that does not ponder itself <laughs> to assure that the human does not have the time the space the energy the resources the 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 preformed habits through the customs of the people around them to be pondering self inquiring individuals so that they could have the the understanding to look just a little bit outside to see that mom is a construct that they not not our mom but you know the cat as your mom here is 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 a construct uh, uh but I'm calling it a vehicle of power that was created to convince you to be something fundamentally that you're not and in such a way that your whole life is basically well, it's it's limited in its potential right from the start because they've intentionally put you into a model that they know doesn't really match your 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 squirrelness. They put you in a cat form, the cat family, so to speak. And so we all keep growing up thinking we're cats. None of us are cats. Metaphorically speaking, of course, you can put any animals in there and interchange them. As long as there's some degree of feasibility that a squirrel would act like a cat long enough for it to be noticeable. Like, I imagine there may be some period of time where, like, squirrels will eventually, their biological instincts might, I don't know how long that's sustained, but uh, at, at the very least, for the early times, that imprinting holds for quite a while. That in and of itself tells you something, and it certainly serves enough of a metaphor for me to 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 take note of it. That's what I've done. So now, what do I talk about next? We're about halfway through, and got a couple different choices, but I think I'm gonna go with. Uh, all righty, I'm gonna go with. Uh, let me just see. I like to pick. I get. I get a few multiple titles, and then or multiple things, and then I decide what it is that I feel like talking about. So, you know what? I didn't plan on talking about this one, but I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about philosophy kills. That's what I'm going to talk about. So, let me just get this little puppy up here. These are for the the, the notes I had. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about philosophy kills. So I, I don't know how much longer, I'll, uh, how long I'll talk about. I may actually go from philosophy kills to uh, something else right afterwards. It'll still be. I think that's what I'll end up doing. I'll put these two parts that I want to talk about uh, in one, one overall topic. The overall theme: philosophy kills. And and I'm gonna read something that I wrote a couple of days ago and. I shared it on the Frico Talks the News page, and that was it. And it's in the nascent form, a uh, theory that is forming that I'm exploring. I know, I know I'm, I'm not settled on it at all. I've just, I just began pondering on this about maybe a month ago, and I'm now starting to formulate some more concrete notions of what I'm trying to tell myself. That's about the best I can tell you. Philosophy is fundamentally the semiotic, and for those that don't know, semiotic is just like science and symbols, and so it's like language. It's all the ways that we communicate verbally, otherwise all kinds of customs. All, it's a whole, it's complicated, but but essentially that's what it means. Uh, so it's fundamentally the semiotic container of potential vehicles of power for a class of individuals I have referred to as citadelians, and then I was also calling them exemptionists, and and then I even wrote here, but uh, I, I never. Oh, well, I'll read what I wrote. Though now I suspect the latter might be a class in and of itself, just below that of the citadelian. The citadelian is the individual that can reasonably assume they can literally get away with murder. 
directly or indirectly, or at least an assumption that is based on a high probability of actually being true. Reasonably assume if I kill this person, i probably uh, get away with it. I refer to them as a uh, citadelian because they are usually surrounded by walls of lethal power, almost literally wherever they go. No one touches these people physically without going through significant security protocols, including any agent of any state or corpo state. So we got that. This person is a walking citadel. That's why I call them citadelians. It's not like there's not a group of people to go, we are the citadelians, you know. It's a citadelian is just a placeholder to identify these groups of people that have this type of real power. The exempt, and, and for me, by the way, power is simply the ability to influence action. It's not either good, bad, or anything. It just is, and it is just... Uh, in and of itself is sort of a placeholder that I identify because power ultimately is the perception of the ability to influence action more than it is the actual ability but that's a whole other story but that for simplistic reasons and it is uh, it is uh, f fair enough you know closely enough true power is simply the ability to to influence action so the Citadelian has the, the power, the ability to influence the action that would lead individuals around them to do what has to be done to assure that if they murdered someone, nothing was going to happen to them. That, that is the Citadelian. But it is largely the Citadelian... Okay, so oh, oh, I skipped the Exemptionist. So now the Exemptionist is the individual that must mind the key coercive violation. So they can't, if, if they murder someone really, really, really low down in the scale, maybe they could get some degree of protection. Uh, some, some people in some, whatever the society's category of subhuman is, if they kill within that group then maybe possibly but even then not necessarily guaranteed they they would they shouldn't in general act under an assumption that they could literally get away with murder not even like if it's open theft uh especially higher numbers of theft certainly not rape uh again rape has that other qualify generally qualifier generally if if it's among one of the subhuman classes, you can reasonably assume to get away with it, uh, possibly. But you can't even at that be guaranteed because, you know, especially when you're an exemptionist, you've got exemptionists that are competing with you. So if they find out you've done any of this stuff, you can darn well bet they'd be happy to see you get crushed. So that's one of the reasons why you can't feel as secure as a citadelia can. Uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's largely free from the consequences of other coercive actions. And they're also able to acquire means of literal exemptions written into laws and regulations that allow them, you know, more often than not, to overcome restrictions with economic compensation in the form of special licensing. I mean, a classic example is in New York State. If you have, if you're a millionaire in New York State, you can get a kid seal carry license just like that. Relatively speaking, just like that. The others, it might take you years. It may take you, uh, depending on your level, maybe a day, but at most probably a month or two. Uh, but you can get it. You just, you got the money, you can get it. Politicians largely fall into this category until they get to the highest levels of national office, and even then their status as a citadelian is, is hardly assured. Most of the people that you see in front of the camera are, are most overwhelmingly exceptionist. My, my theory is, generally speaking, you, I... I'm sh there's all there's always going to be a certain amount of citadelians that absolutely part of what I call the apex exit part of their apex existential demands that they be they be the face for various reasons so there there are some folks in front of the camera that are real citadelians but uh, on the main most of the people you see are not there most most citadelians uh, it's there's a lot of reasons why it's not in your interest to be out there putting their names attaching to things they don't want that they don't want that accountability philosophy okay so okay now we've 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 explained the exemptionist now now let's get to the next step i keep trying to get a little too far ahead but it is largely the citadelian from which 
the philosophers of the age have ultimately served. This is my current working theory. Ultimately, philosophy exists as a means of legitimizing the exclusive licensing of coercive permission or undermining the factions of Citadelians currently benefiting from this society's licensing system. It is the method by which thought is contained in terms that advantage the particular faction of Citadelian in power or in subversive competition to that power by competing factions of Citadelians. So what we're talking about, the theory I have is, is essentially... Philosophy is the the semantic battleground where citadelians sow the seeds of influence that help them control those outside of the citadelian fold. These philosophies generally come from and are influenced by and championed by people largely in the exemptionist class. And then the other way that uh, this uh, philosophy comes to be used is as a means for one group of citadelians to seek to supplant the other group of citadelians whose, whose, whose particular tribe is, is more completely in control. Has, has, it's the higher, higher citadelian. The lower citadelians seeking to supplant the higher citadelians, and that's Fundamentally, when you see shifts in philosophy and when you see systems being undermined, it's because they have to be in order to justify the particular types of vehicles of power that the new coalition of power needs. So when it's the when when you are a king <laughs> and you're ruling with the whole concept of divine rule, uh, why 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 is that why is that the uh, prevailing view of the day? Do you have kings because of the philosophy, or do you have philosophy because of the kings? You have philosophy because of the kings, is what my theory is. So the divine right of kings and the philosophical justifications that were created to to back that stuff up. Yeah, that'll be the prevailing uh, prevailing view until you start to see some of these egalitarian. John Locke, whatever, and these folks that uh, start to come along and, and come up with uh, basically systems that disperse power to a greater number of individuals that happen to be in the classes that they're writing. <laughs> so John Locke is lobbying for people that maybe are not all in the highest Citadelian class to, to get a little bit of sugars. But uh, what it really turns out to be is the small group of Citadelians derive their power from a certain faction of exemptionists. The, the, when uh, at that time, what, what had happened, w so what had happened with this? Before then, intellectualism was primarily the purview of religion and the state. And then in this, in this transition phase, intellectualism, if you will, became the purview of of largely the the, the merchants, the uh, the exemptionist, if you will, that had the money to pay for people to produce ideas that uh, legitimized this concept of liberty, extended from the royals to everyone else, this concept of liberty. So, liberty becomes a philosophical construct and uh, not the other way around philosophy doesn't lead philosophy is is the tool i mean it leads to some degree well, you know what back that up philosophy does it uh, the ideas do not lead what 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 leads are the citadelians that largely choose the ideas that will end up being perpetrated. In many instances throughout history, we see often leaders that uh, literally take philosophies under their wing, philosophers under their wing. Why, why do you think? Why do you think philosophers and kings are always find each other? It's 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 simply because the philosopher gives the uh, the semantic uh, trick. Uh, it's it's a magic trick. It's like it gives it a semantic trick to. Uh, 
gloss the masses over with so that they will accept the uneven uh, standards of lethality. The idea that uh, there is the special licensing that goes to a tiny, tiny select few and philosophy continues to have to, well, defend itself <laughs> or defend its, its, basically its benefactors, defend its benefactors from human beings becoming, uh, whenever human beings become aware of uh, uh, just how disadvantageous it is for them to continue granting such imbalances of power to so few people. So philosophy, yeah, it's, it's, as I wrote here, it is the battleground of the most powerful. It is a weapon of war wielded sometimes in fratricidal rage, but more often than not as a means of systemic control of the individual outside the exclusive tribes of citadelian and exemptionists. Now, after I've said all this and I've prepared my yourself for this, guess what? Now I'm going to tell you philosophy is not any of these things. Although it is. Although it's not. Now, what I wrote here was simply, of course, this is wholly and completely untrue. I'm being a little shock and all there, but most of what I said is true, but... There is a key distinction that I want to make here. And uh, if you watched uh, when I was doing the daily version of this show, I would, I would again over uh, and overemphasize the Well, I would I can't remember what I was going to say. I just totally blew through a blank there, folks. Sorry about that. So, uh, let's see, uh, this is wholly and completely untrue. Uh, yeah, I'm overemphasizing a point there that, uh, but, but I do, I, I would emphasize in my show, uh, again and again, the importance of, um, no, I, st I almost had it there. Didn't get it. Sorry. So the whole, I mean, this is basically Well, this is this is the point I was going to make. Now I remember. The tool is neutral. Philosophy is a tool. Philosophy to me is now, it is fundamentally the semantic, and maybe that's not the right word, but I'm going to use it for now. I think there's probably a better word to use. And maybe it is what I said, maybe it's semiotic, but I don't know. Semiotic, it didn't even though it, I, I, only in a strictly language sense maybe semiotic because semiotics is go kind of goes beyond like written language and I'm fundamentally focused on philosophy as a written language because that's where it derives its ultimate authority it derives its authority from the text that is entered into canon so to speak it's not a strict canon like the bible but there is a bit of an informal canon a legitimization of thought that comes from those who uh, who converse in this language with the proper credentials. <laughs> Got to have the proper credentials. On the main, you have to have proper credentials. There may be some exceptions, but by and large, that's... So philosophy has its way of, of legitimizing what is and, 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 and what is not. So philosophy is a tool to mentally test potential action really and we primarily use that tool well the people who have the capacity to luxuriate in such ponderings because it truly is a privilege of of any creature to have that type of space to invest the time and energy into such ponderings but when you have this capacity to to ponder the potential for action i mean it's i mean it's 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 a blessing it's a gift it's uh i don't take my 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 health has put me into the situation where i i my ability to make money right now is not very good so i have this space where 
I don't know, even on some of my worst days, I'm still able to ponder and read and write and think, whatever. And so in a way, my health is kind of given, and the fact that my wife is, is gainfully employed and making enough money to support me while I'm going through this. And I, that's, that's in a tremendous space for human beings in this world to be in. There's not many people that have that. And in the past, up until a very, very, very recently, most of philosophy, uh, that luxury was afforded only the very wealthiest, the most powerful in the land. So this is why most of your philosophy is, is not so coincidentally a reflection of this battle. And most of the canon philosophy comes from these folks because they control the means of production of philosophy, so to speak. But philosophy is just a tool. It's a neutral tool. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. There's no reason that human beings who wouldn't want to use that, that methodology, you know, to philosophy is a methodology to me at best, a methodology, methodologies, if you will, of pondering the potential for action. Uh, but they use philosophy not to ponder action. It's certainly not to ponder action in any sense that seeks to authentically discover what is. They define what is based upon overwhelmingly appeals to uh, morality. I mean, even Immanuel Kant uh, uh, ultimately comes back to uh, morality. He, he, he compels you. He compels you on the basis of his claims of logic to come back to morality, to adopt a, 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 a the morality of God. I don't know if he exactly means the same, like my God, my Christian God. I, don't, I think his notion of God was different than mine. <laughs> but needless to say, Immanuel Kant, who, who I, I guess he, he, he took... Uh, he took science from the fires of Hume, but he still created this huge space of uh, uncertainty that later people would have to deal with, this whole thing in itself thing. But still, even with that, it, the, the, uh, he literally said, I, I had to reduce space, re reduce knowing or space? What was it? I forget which one it was. I reduced space or knowing. Uh, I had to reduce space to make room for faith because <laughs> ultimately he wanted to hold on to faith but the reason he wanted to hold on to faith was because ultimately uh, a people without a faith is uh, is is not in union they can't they can't have a moral code without that and I mean that, that's that's throughout the ages philosophy's fundamental uh, issue to me and and I'm still I'm not settled on this I'm still not settled on what I'm going to think I could ultimately reject this completely cuz I'm I'm just really really I'm going back and I'm going over a lot of things that I had gone over years ago I'm going over a lot of stuff right now and and looking at it and seeing if I'm I'm looking for the case studies that will totally destroy me and say oh get so far though so far I'm 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 not finding it. So philosophy is the semiotic container of the capacity to know. That's really that's that's it. And I might replace the word semiotic, but essentially philosophy is the semiotic container of the capacity to know. As a tool, that's what it is. It is neutral, serves no one, it just is. But that tool has been monopolistically controlled and wielded by the Citadelians largely because outside of the patronage of the Citadelian class, philosophy offers little in the way of monetizable models, and the seats for those rides are infinitesimally small in number. So long as philosophy remains the toy of the Citadelians, philosophy will never even engage in pursuing questions that might serve the, quote, needs of the vast unwashed that find ourselves outside the, privilege, the privileged citadels of the infinitesimally few. And there you have it. So I'm, at one point I was thinking that my goal in life is to put a gun to philosophy's head and pull the fucking trigger. Put it out of its fucking misery. Yo, bitch, you thugged on us fucking long enough. I mean, by the way, let me tell you what philosophy is in the hands of the Citadelians. The constant replacement 
of the divine right of kings. That's it. That's all, all it is. Divine right of kings within a, a certain convenient vehicle, uh, well, within a, a, a reality of power that uh, necessitates the need for certain vehicles of power. Uh, yeah. That's, I guess that's all I'm going to say about that. I was going to add another part here, and you know, I think I will. I think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to wrap it up with this one. But I am going to consider this is a fourth, uh, this is a topic in and of itself, because even that topic, I went 20 minutes. So this is its own topic, and that is going to be the ancient fascism of the neocon. That's right, you heard me right. The ancient fascism of the neocon? Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. So this is from brooklynrail.org. This is an article from 2005. So our news, man, we're totally up to date. We cover the latest, greatest news. One of the grand mysteries of the 21st century, which may well have to be explained in the 26th second. You know what? I forgot to take it. You know what? I forgot to do this. I want to get into this habit. Uh, when I start the show, I'm going to just, like, take these headphones off. Because, honestly, I, I need a, I don't need them. I, I, don't, I don't know why I had the headphones on. I'm, I'm going to start from now on doing the show without the headphones on. So let me get back to, to, to the article here. One of the grand mysteries of the 21st century, which may well have to be explained in the 26th second century, is how Cornell West became a household name, even a celebrity, while most Americans have never heard of Leo Strauss. The supreme irony is that Strauss's influence is far more pervasive than West's. Strauss's acolytes have penetrated American government and higher education and have proudly influenced the nation's social and public policies. In the Bush administration itself, there are numerous people who have been either taught by Strauss or who are disciples of his ideas, most notably Paul Wolfholtz, Stephen Cambone, the Undersecretary of, De of Defense for Intelligence, and uh, Bush administration itself. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay, never mind. There's a comma here. I didn't see that. Okay, so it's just the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Okay. That's all he is. I was trying to add to your title there. And Bush administration itself. There are numerous people who have been either taught by Strauss or her who are disciples of his ideas. Most notably, Paul Wolf. Oh, I already read that. That's right. So, quoting at length from Strauss's what is political philosophy? Drury cites the following plash passage as the heart of Straussian philosophy. You see how all this is related, right? Oh, by the way, Strauss, wealthy family. He was, uh, I think he was either, I don't know, I think he was in Germany during the Holocaust. He's a Jew, so that's relevant. And then he came to America. Wealthy, wealthy family. I'm not sure if the family is exemptionist or citadelian. I wouldn't know, but uh, I think there are plenty of, when it comes to these philosophers, the wealthy philosophers, I think plenty of them come from citadelian families, but, but probably not most. Philosophy or science, the highest activity as man, is the attempt to replace opinion about all things by knowledge of all things. But opinion is the element of society. Philosophy or science is the attempt to dissolve the element in which society breathes. Now, you just take that in. If you're watching the segment before this, my, my definition of philosophy. Philosophy is the semiotic container of the capacity to know. And so their definition, this is, this is Strauss. Philosophy or science is the attempt to dissolve the element in which society breathes. He's, he's murdering philosophy, dude. Taking a hatchet to philosophy. And thus endangers philosophy. 
Yeah. Now, at this point, he should shut the fuck up, right? Nope. Hence, philosophy or science must remain the preserve of a small minority, and philosophers or scientists must respect the opinions on which society rests. Philosophy or science must remain the preserve of a small minority. And philosophers or scientists must respect the opinions on which society rests. So in other words, he believes that there should be a lot less philosophers, and the philosophers should be controlled by a small minority, and the philosophers should be hemmed in by uh, what this minority tells these philosophers. Uh, uh, must respect the opinions on which society rests. So, whatever the opinions of that society are, you can't be rocking the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, he's writing at a time when he is... I mean, he's coming over to America late. He's not part of the... Of the uh, well, no, actually, hold on. He's... he's coming over to America uh, I don't know when he came over to America I don't know where his, uh, his source of power is but I'm imagining it's probably likely because and, and this is a, a point of fact that the Jewish community is a tight knit community and this is they are the of all the communities in America they're the ones that multiply that, that the money goes through their community ten times before it leaves they, they trade amongst themselves they take care of one another, a tight-knit group. So this is a man who comes in, and he's part of the of the old money, the old power. Not that all Jewish families are part of it, and he might not be, but I'm just saying it's it's highly probable that he is part of the old power. And he is, he is dealing with a time he's writing in, I think at this time he's writing in the 70s, so he's writing, he's one of the few voices at this time that is putting out... Uh, I guess you could call it an intellectual challenge to the notion of what he is calling just simply relativism, but it's the, uh, it's, uh, I guess you could say in one way, shape, or form, it's, a f oh, never mind, I won't, I won't get into that. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go down too many roads that'll make this too long a thing, so, uh, so philosophy or science must remain the preserve of a small minority and philosophers or scientists must respect the opinion on which society rests. To respect is something entirely different from accepting them as true. So he's calling for his own form of, uh, well, you know, never mind. I'll just, I'll just read it and I'll let you, uh, just stop interrupting. Philosophers or scientists who hold this view about the re relationship of philosophy or science and society are driven to employ a peculiar manner of writing which would enable them to reveal what they regard as the truth of the few without endangering the unqualified commitment of the many to the opinions upon which society rests. They will distinguish between the true teachings as the esoteric teachings and the socially useful teaching as the exoteric teaching. The Whereas the exoteric, this is the outside, what people can see en masse, teaching is meant to be easily accessible to every reader. The esoteric teaching discloses itself only to the very careful and well-trained readers after long and concentrated study. It's like he's talking about, uh, wow, I mean, it's very, if you're hearing Plato's Republic in his world, yeah, yeah. you might not be, you might not be wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a it's a ph ph philosophically dominant society, but the philosophy is kind of like like Christendom used to be, where people listened to masses in Latin and only got some English phrases, and they got some passion plays with some simple stories, but the 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 the, the full details of Scripture were were protected from there, lest they get too. I mean, this is. 
I don't know why this guy's considered a serious thinker, but there you have it. And Strauss has a major issue with modernity, which proceeds from the Enlightenment, as Drury sees it from Strauss's ideas. The secular heirs of the modern venture continue to cling to the belief that philosophical truth, regardless of its content, is a salutary. They believe that philosophy can replace God and that the Western civilization can withstand the death of God. See, this is how he wants... To so what he wants is, he still wants the spiritual, he wants to be able to have the power of religion over the masses while still s maintaining a place for philosophy to do the real engineering. So he, I guess he, he wants to have his cake and eat it too, and it's a bloody cake. They believe the philosophy can replace God and the Western civilization can withstand the death of God. They have therefore departed with the wisdom of the ancients according to which the masses need myths and illusions to cling to. They need to believe that there is an unchanging moral law sanctioned. See, there it is. This is what they say. They need to believe this. The masses cannot, they won't do what you, you know, they won't live happy, healthy lives if they believe. You know, all this show is tied together the whole squirrel thing you know there this is it this is what i'm talking about now i just i know a lot of people think that it's crazy it's, it's conspiracy theory to imagine that powerful people would uh find themselves uh, concentrating in some ways to seek to uh unleash upon the world ideas and constructs and whatnots to uh keep human beings in this uh container that uh, allows them to exist within the forms that the Citadelians have decided are best for all. Like, why do you think that's such a crazy thought? Have you ever been in any situation in which you've seen a small group of people that have in, uh, an inordinate amount of power compared to a large number of people and what they will do with that power? I mean, even in playgrounds? Of course, of course that, of course. And then when you come into an age in which suddenly you are able to deliver a a, a monolithic mass tone over and over and over and over that all use the selection of, I mean, Noam Chomsky wrote about this, the, uh, the uh, Manufactured Consent, I think, is the book. So... Uh, I mean, he wrote that, I, I think, I don't know when he wrote that. I could be way off, I think, in the 70s. So <laughs> a lot of people figured this out a long time ago. The left figured it out. The reason the left figured it out was because you know, Noam Chomsky did not have the keys to the city. Now, I will say in Noam Chomsky's defense that uh, he somewhat held on to his commitment to not putting the, the, the narrative making in the hands of the few. But the, by and large, the left is totally reversed on that. And the right is totally reversed on it as well. And not so coincidentally, because now the left controls the, that horn fundamentally. The right, for a longer time than people really realize, because their notion of the right is probably a lot narrower than what it really is. But uh, the right uh, controlled that bullhorn for a long time. Certainly, I would say still, even back in 2005, I mean, the, I mean, there's some, 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 I, at this point, I would say that in, in some of the key legitimization powers, even though the media, the news media has always been left leaning since I can remember as a kid, and I remember the news back in the 70s, still that there was a certain amount of uh, civility and legitimization that the news media still gave to some fundamentally curt conservative notions, even things like patriotism. So uh, that, in 2005, still strongly existed. So you could still see why it was at that point that the left was still, still tending to support free speech while the right was still finding terrorist reasons to support the Patriot Act. Uh, but anyway, we'll continue here. Strauss, as is well known, is a partisan of the ancients. This is where we get into the uh, in the whole, you know, ancient fascist. We'll see. 
Strauss, as is well known, is a partisan of ancients, e.g. Plato, Xenophon, and Aristotle, over moderns. So he's called a pre-modern, and it's a whole school of thought. Now, not all pre-moderns are exactly the same conclusions that he has, but he's not the only pre-modern. Uh, e.g. Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. But uh, according to Drury, Strauss has an idiosyncratic, not to say unique, reading of the ancients. He reads them as <coughs> Machiavellians or even Nietzscheans. Thus, Drury strongly endorses, is actually the ultimate source of, the other half of the media image of Strauss. Strauss the Machiavellian. And, and, and by the way, the, the, oh, this is another article. I'm sorry, I forgot to cite. This article now is press.uchicago.edu. And I don't know when this one was written. Let me see. Ah, uh, should have should have put that. I didn't realize that. Let's see when this thing was written, real quick here. And yeah, I don't show articles or anything anymore. I just don't. So, oh, this is an excerpt from the book "The Truth About Leo Tol Strauss," written by Catherine and Michael Zuckert. And when is the when did you write this? It's interesting. It's interesting for me. Two thousand and six. Okay, so so again, same time period as that one up above that one out that that I, uh, I quoted from before earlier. That was from two thousand five. So this is two thousand six. So we're in that we're in that climate. Just to 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 take it, this is the Iraq wars going on. Thus, Drury strongly endorses is actually the ultimate source of the other half of the media image of Strauss, Strauss the Machiavellian. Drury Strauss is a Machiavellian of a peculiar sort, however. Her Strauss <coughs> favors the ancients who agree with <laughs> Machiavelli in all respects but one. They are atheist and amoral, like Machiavelli and Nietzsche, but are critical of the moderns for openly admitting these things. The truth, according to Drury Strauss, is that there is no God. No divine or natural support for justice, no human good other than pleasure. Her Strauss, in a word, is a nihilist. These truths are too hard and too harsh for the ordinary person. Only philosophers are capable, only philosophers are capable of facing their living with them. You know, that might be true to some degree. And uh, I think that if it's true, it's only true because we have these uh, patterns that we introduce to the human beings around us right from birth that immediately disincentivize self-pondering, self-exploration, self-formation. We don't encourage these things at all. We immediately bombard these people with our forms rigidly and absolutely in using deception fraud appeals to authority appeals to emotions all kinds of we give very and i'm talking i'm not talking about the little babies uh i'm talking about like 10 year olds 12 year olds 15 year olds i'm talking about these folks that we are literally still pushing us in them pushing us in them but the us is really not us the us is what we got from the last generation in the story i talked about earlier the cat the dog the, the, the squirrel that grows up with the cat and starts acting like a cat that's us we're squirrels we're acting like cats and uh the philosophers want to they, they 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 they're missing understanding see they are free and so then when we are free our initial response might be panic and terror because it's scary but if you give us time and space you'll find that we can look into the abyss and even when the abyss stares back we can look back and say hey friend how you doing you know what i don't know i don't know if i like this thumbs down or maybe i do thumbs up you know Thus, philosophers must conceal the truth from most human beings and communicate it secretly or esoterically to each other. In place of truth, they must tell the people lies. They must give the people sugar-coated myths that will console them and make them fit for social life. By the way, these are her paraphrasing. She's not, this isn't what he, he didn't literally write this, just so you know this. Uh, but you could argue that maybe he did in, in much more civil tones i guess these myths include teachings about the gods the afterlife and natural justice or natural right the philosophers manipulate the masses with lies and deception 
Uh, the philosophers tell themselves you 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 had to attack this guy pretty viciously, by the way, because uh, he could potentially, if if uh, he could potentially give enough citadelians the uh, the semantic legitimization they need to cut throats. That's and, and apparently maybe possibly he did, <laughs> but Drury insists it is more than anything for the sake of the philosophers themselves. It caters to their desires for power. Just like what you're doing is catering to your desire for power. Whatever. The Straussian philosophers see themselves as the superior few who know the truth and are entitled to the truth. To rule. They affirm the natural right, but right of the superior by which they mean themselves. However, she also has Strauss endorse quite different claims raised by Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic that justice is the right of the stronger, that is, that thesis, the thesis that might makes right. The Straussian philosophy seek to rule indirectly via their influence on the gentlemen, that is, ordinary leaders like George W. Bush or Donald Rumsfeld, who can be manipulated to manipulate the masses. The thing is, Strauss is just describing what has always been. I mean, he's just laying it bare. That might be one of the biggest reasons why everybody had to attack him so hard. He's like, yo! It's like that's why everybody hates Donald. Well, why 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 these folks hate Donald Trump so much is because Donald Trump is literally speaking the true language of the political. Like this is really the language that the political, the political is a vulgar, violent affair that demands rape, pillage, and plunder just for the simplest of acts to take. Well, being a bit hyperbolic, but just for the simplest acts to take place and it should be it should be spoken by people who speak in the language of the vulgar and donald trump he he too faithfully renders the authentic voice of the political that's what and i think maybe that's what strauss did what strauss did was he he too he, he and actually in 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 a paradoxical way he he actually is is doing the very opposite of what he He's calling on people to do. He is literally revealing what what has been going on, and it's it's weird to see the apoplectic reaction from from those that uh, are advancing. In their case, at this time, they're still primarily advancing their. I don't know. Maybe the neoliberal is still the the fundamental clash to this because the neoliberal is doing the same exact model. By the way, and by the way, the neoliberal, the neocon. Those ones are, are so similar. And it's largely the neolibs that were attacking them. And the neolibs were attacking them primarily because the neoliberal vehicles of power, the types of things that they appealed to, what they appealed to was the new morality. And what he was relying on was the foundation of power from the old morality. Moralities build institutions. They build churches. They build think tank groups. They build knickknacks. They build shit. Morality is built shit. And when your morality is built to shit and somebody comes along with a new morality, you're like, fuck that shit. Man, I can't make money off that. I, my family generationals, man. Generationals were making these Catholic wafers. Get the heck out of here with that relative garbage crap. You know what I'm saying? No, no, that humanist garbage can go. What, well, I mean, whatever it is. I mean, so, I mean, that's primarily what, what's going on as, as, as I see the world more and more. I'll, I'll wrap this up here in this last last little part I got here from this. Her Strauss therefore rejects all the elements of political morality we associate, we associate with liberal democracy as defended by modern philosophers like Locke or Kant. There is no natural right to liberty. The doctrine of natural quality is rejected. Instead, Strauss labors to establish the view that the natural human condition is not one of freedom but of subordination. His chief book is a celebration of nature, not the natural rights of man, but the natural order of domination and subordination. The people are intended for subordination, and in the final analysis, the lies the Straussian elite must tell are for the sake of concealing this unpleasant fact from the people. The people need to be fed religion. And thus the Straussians have argued that separating church and state was the biggest mistake made by the founders of the US Republic. I could I could little doubt that uh, he would <coughs> he would come to that conclusion. I don't really think of Leo Strauss as being particularly uh, any more or less than anyone else as far as the uh, 
the scale of nasty or evil or whatever is concerned i don't really I'm, i don't really use the word good and evil unless i'm talking to people who share my moral construct so i have a bill of rights construct that is uh one that i would like to share with the people around me that's a convenient one because of the reality of power that i'm in and what pre-exists bill of rights already exists as a pretty convenient bill of power so i've chosen to adopt that and if you have that then we can talk about good and evil in those constructs and uh, i also have christian beliefs i have some broadly accepting views regarding the folks that i will walk in christian fellowship with so uh if you're a christian there's probably a fairly decent chance if you'll have me you probably can share our morality our understanding of good and evil but outside of that i only speak in terms of preference and uh within frameworks of preference that is where good and evil exist and uh, quite frankly, frameworks of preference, they're not all the same. And uh, clinging to an appeal to morality amongst people who, who do not share the same morality consensually, well, well, it requires, it requires manipulation. It requires Strauss. It requires philosophy, but not philosophy in and of itself. Because like I said, philosophy in and of itself is simply the uh, semiotic container for the potential of knowing. And that is, uh, that's a tool that can be used for multiple purposes, ends, means, whatever. So it doesn't need to be what it is. Philosophy could be something that is the, the, the mental gymnastics, if you will, that enable us maybe to think some shit out before we fuck shit up. I mean, that, that would be useful philosophy. Let's, let's do some ponderings and imaginings and see if we can uh, maybe, you know, before we build that building let's let's just test this out and see if there's some fires before we build it like that's that's how i find philosophy could be useful and still it's not useful so long as it the, the, whatever philosophy comes from the wealthy uh it's useless it's 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 wh whatever you, you need to find philosophy that comes from people who have vehicles of power that rely upon uh the 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 the, the non citadelians the 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 poors the that that they they have a a fundamental self interest to advance the the power disadvantage of the many over the few or in this case under the few we'd like it to be over the few because that's the way it should be the many should always have more power than the few duh of course but that's hardly ever. It, ha it has been the case that periods of time throughout history for various reasons, but, but by and large, it's never been able to be sustained for long. In large part because amongst the many is the next crop of uh, people who imagine that, hey, maybe it's my turn to kill people. <laughs> I'll need a philosophy to justify it, but I'll, f I'll find something, I'm sure. And I think with that, that's how I'm going to end this episode. So I thank you all for watching Frico Talks the News this, uh, this episode. I don't even know what I'm going to call it. I'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. 7 a.m. 7 a.m., I guess. That's what I'm going to post this. 7 a.m. Friday. 7 a.m. Eastern. Eastern. U.S. American Eastern. See you then. <laughs>